and we're here live on this Saturday evening. It is dark outside. You're here on C Major before the show, and we're getting a little bit of a late start tonight, but we're glad you're here. Thank you for being here. It feels like it's been a long time since I saw you, and so... We have a lot to talk about. I want to catch up with you and then, of course, see you a little bit later over at the C Major Radio Show because this is the warm-up to that. But you are listening to C Major before the show. Stay with us today because we have a lot to cover on today's podcast. C major porter and it's it's been a while it feels like it's been at least a week since I saw you but I know I did send some information along the week just to let you know what we might be talking about today today's topic is a fun topic I really grappled with the idea of doing something fun versus doing something more on the serious side of things. So I'm actually going to be doing a little bit of a, a little bit of playing today too. So I hope you enjoy that. But tonight's topic is fun chord progressions for curious music making, or if you prefer, for curious music makers. So we're going to talk about some chord names that I came across. I'm going to be responding to a group of curious music makers that are out there that want to know more about chords. And so you're the reason that I do this podcast. It's not just for something that I'm doing just to be doing. I mean, I I really wanted to respond to what was happening to me as I as I came across all of these different topics that my students were bringing to me. And I thought, you know what? Someone else has to be going through this too. And so now we're in a position to really have those conversations over coffee. You know how I feel about coffee and conversation. And I really try to encourage my students to do that too. Even if you're not of the coffee drinking age or you would prefer to have something other than coffee, it's fine. You can pretend that you're drinking coffee over your pink drink or your frappuccino. And just make it a habit of talking maybe in three dimensions. How would you talk to yourself about your music making? How would you talk to your friends about your music making? How would you talk to someone professional about music making? And I think if you think in those dimensions, I think you'll be okay. Because it's more than just memorizing facts. Although that can be done too. Responding to curious music makers. That's what we're talking about tonight. So I've been really, I don't know any other word to use, but really blessed. I've been really blessed to to have such a variety of students. And maybe it's because of the way we were taught in grad school just to really open yourself up to having these types of conversations because if you if you decide to limit yourself to just one type of student you really are going to miss out but open yourself to all different types of learners learning styles philosophies and just be open to trying on something new with your students, having your students try on something new as well. So I'm speaking to my colleagues, the teachers that I've been speaking with recently, if you're listening to tonight's podcast. And I have some shout-outs tonight, too. A lot of shout-outs, more shout-outs than normal. I'm giving shout-outs to students, to potential students, 
to music makers who are making music online. And I'm just going to take my time tonight, really, you know, because it's been a while. I'm going to tell you what I've been up to more specifically, but not too much detail, but I'll tell you what I've been up to a little bit later on for tonight. And the first shout out that I have is to a student that plays lullabies for her baby sister. She explained to me that her baby sister sometimes gets annoyed with her and and one way she can get on the right side of her sister's temperament, so to speak, is to play songs that make her smile or play songs that make her her laugh. And I was so touched by that. I mean, here's a student who has a natural playing ability when it comes to playing by ear and can pick up songs really at the drop of a hat, just naturally does it. And we worked really, really super hard on bringing her up to speed with her sight reading ability and just recognizing note symbols. And she has really, really grown and put a lot of time into it. And I had no idea that she was using her music making in this way. One thing that really had impressed me about her early on was that she wanted to be the one who taught her friends to play piano and went on to inspire someone in her community to take piano lessons. And so I just thought that was really, really, really great. She was really the type of student who always, from the very beginning, wanted to share her music making. But now she's found another reason to make music, and that is to make her baby sister a little happier with her music making. So shout out to her. Now I want to give another shout out to a student that has improved his technique. And this student has worked really, really hard to do this because before the student was playing with longer nails and Then we had the conversation about why the nails should be shorter, and then we worked on the way that the hands are being positioned on the piano and and to play with firm fingertips. And there, of course, are these wonderful videos on YouTube. If you ever want me to point you toward those, there's a a world-famous pedagogue on YouTube, and... He's the best of the best. He's also an editor for a very famous magazine as well for pianists. And So anyway, if you want to take a look at those videos, then let me know. I mean, it's one of the top resources out there for, for anyone looking to better their piano skills. And so my student knows about those videos. But at the same time, we've also worked really hard because I think I've said this before on the podcast that sometimes Hannon is not the number one choice of piano teachers. Neither is Cherney. But the student really embraced wanting to learn and improve his technique and has shown me that he is serious about doing it. So I want to give a shout out to him. And so, the next student that I want to give a shout out to, now this is very unique, you're going to laugh when you hear this. (laughs) Yes. I know that I have students that are grateful for their dog, they're grateful for their cat, but here's a student that plays pop tunes on the piano, and would you believe it, her dog barks every single time she plays this one particular piece. 
I believe the song she said was called This Is Gospel by a group called Panic at the Disco, which she introduced me to. I had not heard of this group and wasn't aware of the song. And then after she told me this, I just thought it was really adorable. And I thought, I wonder what the dog is responding to. Is the dog responding to the repeated notes? Or is the dog reacting to the chord changes? What is the dog triggered by that inspires the barking every single time she plays this one particular song? So, shout out to her. I just thought it was a really adorable story. And and she even even volunteered to send me a, an audio file of, of her playing the piano with the dog barking. But I said, no, don't go through anything that will will take up your time, but if you just happen to have some sort of documentation of that, that would just be really great to hear that. So, and you might be wondering, well, why don't you just do that live with the dog? Well, that's a different story altogether. Anyway, shout out to her. She's inspired by her pet and plays pop tunes for her dog. Shout out to her. Now, I told you this list was long tonight. I have another shout out to a student who I just really adore this student because this student has really shown me that they want to learn from social media, but at the same time have a real live teacher present. And so to be able to have these conversations with this student has been priceless for me because I would have never thought a student would use social media in the way that they are using it. So the student learned to play a Halloween song all on their own from YouTube. And then the student, once they sat with me to to show me the song that they were aiming to learn and then to get a score of the piece which again was just remarkable the parents were involved they were all excited it was just really remarkable moment and then once we went over this really difficult passage I would say difficult or challenging challenging to the student then the student was able to snapchat that part of the song that the student knew how to play well and then send it to the followers that were going to see it on Snapchat. So I just thought that was really adorable and there was some concern about whether or not the followers would be really receptive to what was posted. But anyway, shout out to that student. <laughs> Using social media as a reinforcement for piano lessons. Okay, so I have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five more shout outs. Okay, so hang in there with me. And I have students that wanted to play Halloween songs this year, so they really surprised me, but they wanted to play Halloween songs about specific things. I think I already shared one story with you about a student that was learning to play a Halloween song that had to do with a parade, a Halloween parade, and some other animals in the story. But there were some students that challenged themselves to play Halloween songs about pumpkins this year. So I was really surprised. This this one particular student was not the most easy student to satisfy when it came to picking out pieces, but I finally was able to find a piece that the student really liked. And if you prefer the word pupil, I can say pupil. My piano teacher used to say pupil. So this one pupil 
prefer to play songs that sounded either fast or were in a minor key, never playing songs that were slow or anything like that. But I really admired the students' tenacity that they were really willing to put in the time. The first time I really see the student, seen the, first time I've really seen the student really focused on learning one piece and learning it well and not being put off by how challenging it is. And so it was just really, really nice to see. So that student is still working on that song. It's about the pumpkins. So shout out to that student. I think that's great. You can see the growth. When you see the growth, just a little bit of growth, it just, it's just so exciting to me, really. It's just watching a person really grow in their music making, which is just phenomenal. And so now we're coming down to about the last four student shout outs, I think. And I have a student that wanted to learn to play a Beethoven piece because their parent modeled it for them. So here we go. Again, one of Beethoven's pieces. Again. And one of the more famous pieces. Some some may say it's overplayed, overperformed, over-recorded. No matter what they say, it's still a popular piece. And it's still by Beethoven, and people want to learn how to play it. And so I couldn't believe how much the student really lit up as soon as I said, I think I might be able to find a score that will work for you. And this is after a couple of years of study, but the thing that really set it off was that the parent was sitting at the piano modeling this Of course, while I was not there, this is away from piano lessons, but to come into the lesson and to be told, oh, my my parent was showing me this. And then just throwing the suggestion out there saying, well, would you like to learn to play that? And just to see the light on the student's face was just amazing. So... Thank you to Beethoven, and a big shout out to the student for taking on a challenge, trying on something new. We're going to be trying that probably within the next week or two, and so I just wanted to give a special shout out to this student. So, down to the last three shout-outs. I have students that want to play Christmas songs. If you're a teacher and you're listening to the podcast, do you have have that? Does that happen to you? Where you have students that want to learn to play Jingle Bells, students that want to learn to play Jingle Bell Rock. So, I think it's different for every year. Sometimes you get students that want to play other songs for the holidays. But they specifically said Christmas songs, and it included... Jingle Bells and Jingle Bell Rock. Once I had a student that wanted to play Christmas songs all year long, and of course the parents were like, no way, (laughs) we're going to hear that all year long. (laughs) I'm sure there's a club for that. Just like there's a club for anyone who wants to talk about coffee culture and autumn all year long. There must be a, a a club on social media somewhere where that's all people talk about all year long. Either way, if I had to take a poll, I'm not taking a poll, but if I had to take a poll, I would say the number one song this year for piano lessons is Jingle Bells and Jingle Bell Rock. So shout out to those students who will be learning to play Christmas songs. We're making a list. We're checking it twice. Okay, now I have a student that is starting to transpose on his own. 
And it's so interesting because as soon as I was ready to shout out this one student, then I had another student. Same thing. Something about Marietta Little Lamb playing it on white keys and then playing it on black keys and and just doing it on their own. It's like a little discovery. They discovered it. I never said you need to play it in different places. I didn't say that. But then I tested this one student after this same student. I tested another student and said, how would you like to play Mary Had a Little Lamb in a different place? And do you know, right away, the student was able to play Mary had a little lamb in four places on the keyboard and was just so proud. They couldn't wait to tell their parents. It was a really, really nice moment. So shout out to students that are very interested in transposing on their own, challenging themselves. I had a one student, I think a few weeks ago, I might have said that I had this one student that wanted to transpose everything into other keys. So 12 different ways he wanted to be able to play it and, and was not afraid of that. And said, okay, now that we've done, see, let's do this. And then just kept going and going and going. He said, I want to be able to play this in 12 different keys. So I'm really happy about that because I think there, it's, it's not a myth, but I think there's sometimes an understanding that the road to transposition needs to be gradual. But in my case, I've seen it both ways. I've seen it where students, my students really wanted to transpose right away and weren't afraid to do it. And then others that really shied away from that. And it was so interesting because this one student said, you know, I'm shy, right? I said, oh, I didn't know that. So I said, well, you know, how would you feel about How would you feel about playing Mary Had a Little Lamb in other places on the piano? And then all of a sudden, they tried on something new, they opened up to the possibilities, and they were on their way, and then they had something to show their parents. So shout out to those students. Okay, now, my biggest shout-out of the evening is a student that has been working with technology, really trying to improve her artistry through technology, challenging herself to develop beats, working with different original melodies that she's coming up on her own, trying to stick with themes of dream and space and working in collaboration with some friends, using a controller, using GarageBand, wants to release a song this year, before the end of the year. Wants to produce it, wants to master it, wants to mix it. And it's an older student, of course, you know, someone who's still in in high school. But it was just amazing to hear the music making that she's challenging herself with has come a long way. I've seen, to be honest, I've seen a lot of the improvements that take place in my students. I've seen a lot of the improvements take place with the students that play other instruments. I wonder if you've seen the same thing, if you are, again, someone who does either classroom teaching or private teaching, what you've seen. And so that's the case with this particular student but huge shout out to this student huge huge shout out and so if you don't mind just join me now in giving a really huge shout out to all of my students and big cheers because they are amazing and I can't wait to see what they're going to do next. So big shout out and cheers for all of the students. And by the way, that was just for this week and one week. 
and had all of this happen. So, again, just amazing. Just amazing. You are listening to C Major Porter. I'm here on C Major Before the Show. What I'm going to do right now, I'm going to grab a cup of tea. Get some green tea with some ginseng, and, and I'm going to be right back. For the show, I'm your host, C Major Porter. We're going to move now into talking about some other things that may pique your curiosity for today. But before I do that, I just want to know a little something more about you. How are you doing? How are you doing with your wellness and your well being? Is music making helping you with that at all? What does music and music making have to do with wellness and well being? That's kind of this underlying question that we are tapping into every once in a while. I mean, this is not a show about health and psychology or anything like that, but those are topics that I'm really interested in. I want to know. I wish there I wish that someone would develop an app for that. I'm sure there is an app for that somewhere where you can measure your wellness based on your music making but then I have another question are you curious at all about rap music and rap music history if so we're going to put your curiosity to the test and we're going to look at some chords from a very famous tune that believe it or not came about in 1979, 40 years ago. Can you believe that? I couldn't even believe that. That just blows you away. Four decades of this same song, and it sounds just as fresh 
as it did the day that it came out. I recall where I was when it came out. And so there are ways to study this this music if you care to. Someone at one point had asked me if I wanted to to develop a course to look at music from the late 70s and 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 to study a little bit more of the history and and to teach that to to anyone who may be interested. I think it might have been for an undergraduate course or continuing education course, something like that. But anyway, it's been a while since since that came about. But we're going to take a look at it. I'm I'm curious about the core changes myself, and so if it's something that you want to stick around for, see us over at the C Major Radio Show because I will spell out those chords. I'm also going to talk a little bit more in detail about the history of music. One of our course books that we use here jumps into the history of of rap, believe it or not. And so we're going to talk about the the way that you can speak in a rhythmic rap and we're also going to talk about if I have the right page well at the time that this book was written they called it the new pop music and then you see a colon, and then you see the word rap. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I mean, I have to be careful of the names that are said and things like that. You have to be so careful, you know, nowadays, just generally speaking. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to leave the music playing here. So when we come back, we're going to walk into some music making, some recorded music making, rather. But now I'm going to change my location. I'm going to take a sip of my ginseng tea. And then we're going to go to where the piano is. And let's see if we can make a little sense of some of the harmonies that were used in this. Okay, so just walk with me for a moment. And we're going to discover this together because I haven't had a chance to go over this prior to the podcast if for some reason we get disconnected I will definitely reconnect with you by just restarting the podcast but hopefully I don't have to do that by the way we didn't talk about the weather today I don't know where you are if you're listening but it was rather chilly I must say I found myself stepping into 20 degree weather this morning and was a little surprised to be doing that so I had to put on one of my hats and try to stay as warm as possible and then it warmed up it's about the in about the 40s okay so I hope it's okay by the way to be talking about this music because it really is from an educational standpoint not from performance we were told in undergraduate school that it was okay to present music for educational reasons music that you did not write yourself but I was really Delighted to see that the authors of this music, of this particular song, were the same for both versions of the song. Okay, so I'll say more about that in in a minute. But I'm more interested in the chords. You know, we talked about basic triads. We went through the music alphabet, and I went in ABC order something I had not done before. And so, Mm. 
Okay. So here it is. Now, you've had a lot of time to, to, to decide how you're going to, to do your chord learning, so to speak. And so one of the things that I encourage is to either get a chord chart, get a book that shows you how to play these chords, and then if you're interested more in the voicing so that you're playing the chords in a way that your hands work together, then I would recommend that as well. Now, if you just looked at this and you just went by the chord changes or you looked at the guitar part and you could see where they're showing you the tablature and and how to play the chords on the guitar, then above that you see the letters. So I just want to encourage you, don't look at the letters and just be turned away. There's an easy piano version, too, that you can look into if you happen to have a copy of the score. And then we're going to talk about some of the notation that's out there for piano players. So when you approach a music service, then you'll know what to ask for for yourself. How would you like to learn to play a certain song? But since I read music, I'm probably just going to read a little bit of this. It seems to be repetitive, so I don't have to read the whole thing. I can just read part of it and then It should sound familiar to you. Okay. So I'm going to play it. I'm not going to play it as you would hear it in a performance. I'm just going to play it so that you hear the the changes. And then what I want you to do is play a little game with me. Same way I play games with my students with having them raise their hand if they hear a certain time value change. Raise your hand if you hear a certain chord change to another chord. And then we'll talk a little bit more over at the C Major Radio Show. I'll say a little bit more about that too. I'll say a little more about that toward the a little bit more about that toward the end of today's podcast, but I'm also going to say a little bit more about how we're going to be changing things around a little bit, just tweaking the show. Now that we have an idea of who some of our listeners are beyond my own students, of course, and what you're looking to hear and what you seem to be getting from the podcast, we can tweak it a little bit more so it suits your it suits your taste. Okay, now I'm just gonna play some sounds and then I'll stop and I'll come right back. Okay, so that wasn't the best, you know, I I played what I was saying, and then I missed the C sharp in the bass. So, I think the reason I did that was because if you look at the other score, there is no C sharp. So I'm really curious about that. I'm going to look at this other score in a moment and see if there's a difference in how the bass line was played. Maybe... The bass line for the original version of the song, which has a totally different copyright, maybe that version included a C sharp in the bass line, and maybe the other version that was copied left out the C sharp. We're going to see in a moment, because I was also very curious to see this particular key signature. Okay, so normally if you play in the key of E, 
E minor. Okay. Then your key signature would be G major, which would be the one sharp. But to see that they have two sharps in the key signature for this was a little shocking. I'm like, okay, so then does that push into a particular mode maybe? Hmm. Because if you have two sharps in the key signature, then then technically you would be in B minor. But yet, I don't see any B minor chords. I only see an E minor 7 chord. E minor 7 says 4, A7 says 4, and then A13. And so it's very repetitive. So without going into the other pages of, of the sheet music, you're just looking at those four chords repeated basically over and over and over again. So... You know, the hands are working together so that you don't play it in a way that would sound strange or strained in a way. But, you know, if I just did an E minor 7 chord, okay, I would play it just like that. And then E minor 7 with a suspended 4, okay, and then A7 chord with a suspended 4. Which would be okay. I need you have to put the D in there, and then of course you know you have your A thirteen chord. Okay, so okay, so that's what you hear repeated over and over again. So, you know, it's so interesting because, you know, now that I've attended my first jazz workshop with the intention of just understanding how rote learning takes place. So you don't have a score in front of you at all. It's just people taking turns literally to take their turn to play progressions for the professor. And he either shakes his head yes or says no or jumps on the piano and tells you what you should be doing. That's how things went at this one particular jazz workshop that I went to. But I wonder, in a jam session, what these musicians would do when they were learning this this for the first time. Were they playing this over and over again for hours? You know, I've had friends that don't re really read music, and so that's what they do. They'll record something into their recording software, and then just loop it and literally just listen to it for hours, which is a different way of learning the music than what we were taught. So if someone that reads music, they would just go, oh, okay, this is it. This is repetitive. Okay, all right, I got it. But someone who didn't read music may want to play this really as many times as they could stand to play it so they really learn it, they really know it. But I think there's a happy medium. I think there's a way to do both. Okay, so now let's put this away. If you have any questions, by the way, about the chords, and then what I'll do differently than what we do here on this podcast is go over to C Major, the C Major radio show and spell it out so you know how to write it on the staff. How does it appear on the staff is, is how I'm going to present it over at the C Major radio show. So I hope to see you over there. And, and by the way, we're trying to give that show a little bit more exposure than what it's had in the past. I'm very happy about that. And so I'm going to spell it out in letters. So feel free to write it out in letters, write it out in text, write it out in the best notation that you can put together for yourself. And then if you can, get a music professional involved so that you know that you're learning in the way that you best learn. So... Now I'm going to get the other copy of the sheet music that I brought. So, again, the authors stay the same, but the intention for the song definitely changed. So let's pull that out. So it's definitely a clear case of one thing came first before the other. It's not a chicken or egg issue. Okay, now this, and even this, I love seeing this because the performance directions are so different. 
if I look at the original, it just has performance direction of moderato, basically, to play moderately at a medium tempo. But this one specifically says play as a groove. And again, you know, it's limited to two pages because it's so repetitive. So imagine you and the musicians that were recording in the studio, then you knew what you were playing. Now, what I love, though, is that you can see right away the bass player decided to do something different. And so you have a lot of split bass chords, which make it sound a little bit more exciting and fresh. But you, uh, there was no denying that where this song came from. Okay, so at the beginning... I'm looking at this, and it says NC. You know what that means? No chord. Now, unless NC stands for something else, let me know. But I've always known that to mean no chord. And sometimes the students will ask me that, and I'll go, oh, what does that mean? Okay, I love also that they're telling you right away to play it eight times. Okay, so let's try that. We're going to try that at the beginning. There are no chords involved. You're just going to hear me playing a bass line. I'm not a bass player, so I'm pretty sure I won't have the groove for this, but let's just hear it. Okay, hold on one second. repeat sign telling you to go back now I just play just the bass line no groove nothing I just wanted to play these individual notes and also wanted to see how they handle the key signature for this particular score so interesting because now they treat it as though the C is an accidental the C sharp rather is an accidental and so before for the other score they went ahead and just made it as a as two sharps in the key signature, so you could just play the C sh the C S sharp when you came to it. So interesting, right? Okay, now the way the chords are presented for this much easier to digest if you are new to chord changes and playing chord progressions. Then you'll go, "Ooh, okay, I know I'm going to be playing seven chords. I'm I'm good with seven chords." If you weren't familiar with 13 chords yet, you might panic a little bit. Or if you didn't know what sus meant, then you might panic when you saw S-U-S. What am I supposed to do? Then you run to your piano teacher and they tell you what to do. So let's see what the right hand is doing for this. So. sounds really empty to me <laughs> if I'm playing uh, just the right hand. I think it's going to work a lot better if I put the hands together. Okay, so now I'm going to not play it rhythmically. I'm just really listening to see what's happening with the changes. Okay, so I want you to listen too. Again, feel free to raise your hand if you hear that I'm changing the chord because there are some split bass chords happening in this in this version. Okay, hold on one second.
laughs> of this. <laughs> have to laugh on that one. <laughs> it's funny, but it's not funny. I should have rehearsed this before I played it. I think for me, playing the chords like that in the right hand are just like I don't understand why I should play it that way. But I think you had to differentiate, you know. You had to differentiate the two scores, even though the songwriters still get credit for both songs. Interesting. So I listened to the recording of this last night. I was inspired to do that because I ran across the article that was talking about the 40 years, or the post, rather. It was talking about the 40-year anniversary of the song. I know you recognize what it is, so I'm not going to say the title. And and when we go over to the C Major Radio Show, I'll talk a little bit more about the lyrics, too. So that's interesting. I didn't know that the lyrics were going to come separately with this, with the sheet music. So it's really interesting to see. Okay, now would I play my E minor seventh chord like this for this particular rap version of the song, as opposed to that? Okay, and then you have a chord over a different bass for the next one. So again, it's going to be worth it for you Worth your time to tune in in probably another 20 to 30 minutes or so. We'll try to go seamlessly and from C major before the show into that show. And then in the future, we'll try to do the same thing. Okay, let me step away from the piano. And I will not be playing over at the C major radio show. So this is the extent of my performance of of this piece and it's not even performance it's just a mentioning of it and playing a little bit of the sounds that you may be familiar with and just to encourage you to listen we will be doing a homework assignment that's based around this as well so I hope you had some fun with it tonight thank you so much and then Now you're going to hear some movement because I'm going to be moving to a different location again, going back to where I was originally. And then we'll take it from there. So chord progressions for curious minds, that's what we were talking about. I was definitely curious because I started to present a whole different set of chord progressions and I thought to myself, you know what, I'm going to wait and do that next week. So I was really inspired by this post that I saw to talk about the history of that because I don't know where you were when this song came out in 1979. I know exactly where I was. And I know exactly we had a recording of these songs that were coming out and how I was able to hear those recordings. And it's just also interesting You've been listening to C Major before the show. I'm your host, C Major Porter. Now I'm heading back to my other location. I'm going to walk into some recorded music that's playing. And then I'm going to check and see what we will talk about for the remainder of today's podcast episode. And then I will give you a preview of what we will talk about next week. So thank you so much for being with us today. And here we are. Okay, so, so far, we've been able to talk about a few things in today's podcast, and it was supposed to be fun. I hope you had some fun today. I really hope you had fun in that. This may have satisfied some curiosity for anyone who had a curiosity about the chords that are involved in some of our vintage songs that are out there celebrating 40 years. 
I was just really inspired by a lot of music that came about in the late 70s and early 80s. I'll say more about that in our next podcast. So you probably want to know what I was doing. Why was I not available last week? I think I've shared with you a little bit about my teacher training pursuits and how it's come about and it's been such a pleasant surprise. But that was the reason for my absence. I'm becoming a better piano teacher for you. I've done a little bit of that this summer and now I'm getting to do it on a more professional development level within the greater New York City area. And it's very exciting and I hope that you see it as a good thing. I'm excited because the better I can become for you, then I think it will just open up so many, so many more possibilities, really. There's so much more research that's out there since I was last in grad school and to be able to get a fresh perspective on it is just really exciting. So that's where I was. And then if I have to be absent again, I will let you know. Join me over at the C Major Radio Show. We're going to be spelling out these curious chords. (laughs) There's nothing really funny about it, but just I like to keep a fun vibe to the podcast if possible. A wise man once said, education is not just preparation for life. Education is life itself. And so I'm going to be seeing you next week right here on C Major Before the Show. No Penelope. We thought about doing Penelope for Halloween and presenting her as another spooky character for the podcast. But I put the brakes on that. And so we may decide to bring her back at another time. I'll keep you posted. More progressions, though, next week here as we close out the chords for students course and really close out the year so I plan to bring more progressions to the table and just to challenge you to think about how you're going to put these chords together what makes sense for you and then bring you more academic discussion as usual over at the C Major Radio Show C Homework over at C Major's Classroom I'll be posting that before the weekend gets away And then next week, I want you to think about immersing yourself in the sound of chords. And I ran across this book at a bookstore. It was on sale. It was like $2. I think originally it was $25, but gently used, I think. And so it was interesting because the author used a lot of vernacular that goes on with jazz musicians. And I'm going to be just glossing over that book. It's fiction, but I'm going to be glossing over that to see if there's any mention of jazz chords and to see if he included that type of talk among jazz musicians and his and his idea of what jazz musicians sound like. So we're, we're going to bring that to the table, hopefully next week as well. The C Major Radio Show. Join us over there. Chord Progressions for Curious Minds continues. We'll have a new progression next week. We're immersing into sound with chords, different types of notation. It's all exciting. So whether you are playing easy play notation or big notes for for beginning pianists, whatever it is, we hope to bring it to you in a way that you can get. And so, what type of music making were you doing in 1979? I think I'm going to post that as a poll as well. It's been great to be with you guys. I will see you next week right here on C Major Before the Show.